Let's talk about the ordination of women. Are you an egalitarian, a complementarian, or something even better? And how in the world does that marriage discussion relate to ordination? Numerous media sources have recently reported on Saddleback Community Church's Mother's Day ordination of women. That decision by Pastor Rick Warren is a, is a watershed. Not only is it a shot over the bow of the good ship SS Southern Baptist, which is already at odds with Beth Moore's departure over similar issues, but it'll also be a shot which will reverberate throughout evangelicalism. Now, our purpose is not to pick on Rick Warren today or that discussion. Our purpose is to get down to discussing a more fundamental point. The discussion is important because it reflects a far broader uh, context, undercurrent, being observed in evangelical schools of higher education and filtering down, of course, as it always does, into our churches. And it involves not only ordination, but the whole scope, as I said, of women's role in, in the Bible and women's role in marriage. So we want to look at these marriage models and then make this connection. And I think we can do it real quickly, and I think it'll benefit you as you talk about these things. So let's talk about how marriage models play into the role of women's ordination, shall we? First, we're going to offer a brief overview of these two or three models, and then we'll weigh in on women's ordination in particular. As we talk about marriage models, the egalitarian model comes up first. Now, when we speak of the egalitarian relationship between men and women, we're acknowledging that men and women are both created in the image of God, and therefore, they're equal in every way. While men and women are equal before God in every way, equality does not imply being identical any more than being made in the image of God makes us identical, on the other hand, with God. The fact that males and females are not identical does not speak to their inequality then. Okay, both men and women are inheritors of the same rights and privileges as defined by God. Second Peter 3, seven. Now, the purpose of the complementarian marriage model because this model's the one that's really under attack, where you want to spend just a few more minutes on it, but not very long. By definition, when we speak of the complementary or complementarian model of marriage, we're reminded that it, for at least one purpose, woman was created to be a help meet for man, a help fit. Man needed an equal, someone with which to commune and labor and share his life, and a helper for him to carry out the divine mandate that God had given to him. But, but don't miss this point. By virtue of creation, woman was also given the mandate to have dominion over the creation. It's clear that dominion is to be asserted in the context of her relationship with man. That's, that's pretty indisputable. But the mandate is clear. She, too, has dominion, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And why is that important? Well, this is important because this does away with the idea that woman's only creative purpose on this earth is to free up man for his creative role, his dominion role, and that women have no purpose outside of men. That's just silliness. Now let's look at the basic facts here, shall we? When we think of the complementarian model, we understand that there are at least three considerations which have to shape our thinking. Number one, the complementary model is for all time. God imposed this model before the fall. Its scope precedes Adam and Eve and their lapse so that we can understand by that that it is not punitive. And it's extended to all mankind for all time. Genesis 2. 20 through 24, especially verse 24, Matthew 19, 6. When we discount this complementary model, we discount the very words of Christ, so keep that in mind. Now, secondly, the complementary model is good. It's good. Its value can be associated with the overall goodness of God, for example, even though it's not one and the same, when God provided the curse for fallen men. God wasn't being a bad guy when he did that. Men and women experienced the curse, by the way, equally, but in different contexts. Genesis 3, 16 through 19. So when we speak of the curse, we become aware very quickly there are four entities that were affected. Satan, of course. That's very clear. His curse was punitive. The curse was placed upon the creation through no fault of its own. 
The curse was a merciful act on God's part for our benefit. We often miss that point. If we can imagine fallen men and women living in a paradisical world such as Eden without the effects of the curse, we can soon get a glimpse of the wisdom of God. What a disaster that would be. By requiring both men and women to struggle daily against the effects of the curse, God has saved us from our own natures. The struggles of men and women, however, are both similar and unique. To their gender. In the overall context, man struggles against the thistles and the woman in respect to maternal matters. Now, the consequences of the curse are lovingly tailored to each gender. God didn't dissolve marriage as a result of the curse. Rather, he strengthens marriage in the curse by way of the complementary model. He strengthens the marriage of Adam and Eve as they face the issues together and share in their struggle against the curse. The complementary model, then, is a gracious gift from God to help men and women navigate the effects of the curse together, to bond them together in their respective gender identities. Now, thirdly, and I'm sure you're aware of this, the complementary model also speaks to our our natures as we were created. Gender roles relate to how God made us. They're not externally imposed through some environmental conditioning, though they may be perverted and certainly abused by men, but by nature. Men and women respond differently to their worlds in a variety of ways. This doesn't make one gender superior to the other. Both are good in the eyes of God. God made them both. Both enriched the other gender, Genesis 1, 1 through 31. Now, one major difference is cited by the Apostle Paul. When arguing forward from the creation and the fall, Paul has some assertions to make. Paul asserts that one dominant differential, which is inherent in our physical bodies, one dominant gender differential that will not be erased by culture and by spiritual regeneration until we receive our resurrection bodies must be noticed. Due to her nature, and for very good reason, the woman is more easily deceived. 1 Timothy 2.14 Now, while we don't understand the full implications of that statement, let's be very clear. We understand that its immediate context has to do with spiritual perception. We can mitigate this discussion by pointing out other areas where the female gender outshines the male gender, but the fact itself remains, and it's very clear, it's very, very obvious in Scripture, the woman is more easily deceived. Paul says this was evidenced by the fall of the first proto-woman, by Eve. The complementary model is for this reason, and this reason alone, that she is not to assert spiritual authority over the man. The complementary model, then, is graciously given by God for the woman, benefit and protection as well as the man's. Let's talk about another marriage model, one that isn't really stressed enough. Let's talk about the Christological model. So what's the purpose of the Christological model? Will, will the best marriage model please stand up? As, as the women's ordination discussion or conversation moves towards center stage in evangelical Christianity, it's very important for the Bible student to understand that these two aforementioned marriage models were never intended by God to be pitted against each other. One was not supposed to replace the other. Both the egalitarian and complementary models are alive and well, and, pardon the pun, they complement each other equally. So it's not a question of which has priority in a particular context or culture. This is because the Old Testament model of marriage has been enhanced by what was then a mystery, the all-encompassing doctrine of Christ, a mystery yet to be revealed. Ephesians 5, 22 and 23 articulates this glorious truth in words so glowing and yet so concise that they form the basis of virtually every biblical wedding ceremony. And careful readers will notice that this passage blends the egalitarian method and the complementarian models under the roof of an even higher authority, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who represents the head of both men and women. Now, the old models are not negated. They had nothing to do with the law, but rather they are gloriously enriched and finely balanced in Christ. They're wonderful. The Christological marriage model goes far beyond marriage contracts, such as those that we see in the Old Testament and scratch our head once in a while as we read about them. It celebrates our essential oneness and unity in Christ.
Sabbath. So, let's wrap this up. Here lies the danger with respect to the ordination issue. A lion's share of the argument offered by those in favor of ordaining women for ministry will be built by insisting that we have overstated the complementarian role of women. It'll be a pendulum effect. It's in step with our rights-obsessed culture. But this pendulum effect will emphasize the egalitarian rights of women while diminishing their complementary role as being somehow demeaning. And that's why we call this issue a watershed. It's paramount for the biblical pastor to be able both to explain and impose the Christological marriage model, a model which places Jesus Christ at the head of both churches and homes. So let's talk about how marriage models do and do not relate to the ordination of women very quickly. Number one, ordination then is not an equality issue. Either in our homes or in our churches, both men and women are heirs of the promises of God, both are recognized equally in Scripture. Both are integral to God's plan and program, and by all means, equality is not on the table here. Number two, ordination is an authority issue. God is a God of order. God commonly establishes lines of authority through primogeniture and headship. What comes first is first, both in responsibility and authority. Adam was first created, then Eve, 1 Timothy 2, 9-13 for that very reason that we fault Adam. This is not a matter of intelligence, by the way. Outside the creation, Jesus Christ is in submission to the Father, though he reigns co-equally with the Father. We don't think of him as being inferior or less intelligent. He's not inferior in any way. But ordination is an authority issue. Thirdly, ordination is a church issue because the church is largely a composite family consisting of multiple families. The scriptures teach that the same dynamics are to be observed. More importantly, Paul insists that the same dynamics are in play, as we have noted in Ephesians 5, in no uncertain terms. The relationship between a man and a woman is reflected in the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. That's an embedded link. And this is the point where marriage models and ordination models converge. That's why we had to talk about them together. The relationship between Jesus Christ and his church are reflected in marriage and vice versa. Number four, ordination is a spiritual issue. As with the role of the husband in the home, the role of the elders and pastors concern itself first and foremost with biblical and spiritual issues. Now, temporal issues. In this respect, the male is most highly qualified, albeit imperfect and less qualified than the female in many other contexts. Nonetheless, the spiritual welfare of our homes and our churches are directly related to the commands of God who knows what is best for us, even when we cannot see it ourselves. Now, let's be very clear here. Rick Warren is to be admonished. He's to be admonished for flying against the direct admonitions of the Word of God. Unless you think there are no direct admonitions, you can find there are many people responding to Rick Warren even as we speak with direct biblical statements. My friend uh, Bruce Hoyan on the link noted below does a nice job of dealing with that from a little different angle. But nonetheless, we're not talking about the scriptural mandates. We're talking about how the left side of Christianity is going to try to impose ordination upon us. That was what we were talking about today. So here's the conclusion. Be aware that the arguments of Saddleback Community Church, the arguments they have employed to loosen biblical standards within the church with respect to ordination, will, mark my word on this, will be used to weaken and dissolve the biblical dynamics that God has embedded in the biblical home, because the arguments are one and the same. Thank you for listening. This has been a Biblical Minute from biblicalminute.com and standingtrue.com.